During Poor People's Campaign Program last Thursday, faith beaters, they called on those in Washington to end the filibuster. That program included washing a practice common amongst Christians on Holy Thursday to symbolize the need to wash away, quote, the Senate rule used to block progress. Joining us to discuss is Reverend Dr. Barber. He's president of Repairs of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Great to see you, sir. Good to see you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tell us why you think it's so important and significant to get rid of the filibuster at this time. You know, the filibuster is a very regressive piece of public policy uh, that's not even constitutional, which is why today uh, we will have over 100 clergy representing different faith traditions and representing thousands who will be in Washington, D.C. at the National City uh, Disciples of Christ Church. When you look at the history of the filibuster from the 1800s, every piece of anti-slavery legislation was filibustered. Labor laws were filibustered. The attempt to give women the right to vote was filibustered. Um, unemployment benefits were filibustered. Civil rights legislation was, was filibustered. The attempt to let 18-year-olds vote was filibustered. There's been no point in this his country's history that somebody didn't attempt to use the filibuster to block us moving forward and moving this country forward. It's not just about race. The filibuster has been used to try to hold up racism and classism, elitism, and it's just not what was intended. It, it, this, it, doesn't, it makes it so senators don't have to debate in front of the people. All they have to do is say, we have a filibuster, we don't have 60 votes, and we never know where people stand on issues, and that's not democracy. Doctor, I have a question in terms of policy. One of the things that we saw in the fight over the reconciliation bill was that even Democrats did not have 51 votes for a $15 minimum wage. That's something you've been outspoken on and criticized in terms of that moving forward. What do you think needs to be changed in terms of convincing these senators otherwise? Well, you know, they didn't have it because of Joe Manchin. And Joe mm -hmm. Manchin did something shameful. The people in his own state, I'm talking about white people from Appalachia, were very upset. I've been up there because 352,000 people in his state make less than a living wage. And I thought, first thing we should have done with that particular vote is the bill that came from the House should have been put on the floor. It let the parliamentarian uh, suggest that it what wasn't uh, applicable, then the vice president could have overruled that and it would have taken 60 votes for them to stop it. And they didn't have 60 votes. Well, we didn't get there. So what we've got to do now is continue to push in these states. Our campaign is raising up and pushing these senators. You know, it was shameful that eight white Democrats, five men, five, three women, on the Friday before Bloody Sunday anniversary, voted against a piece of legislation that would have lifted over 40% of black people out of poverty and low wealth. You know, we have to start talking about these, ter these issues in terms of race and class, and we're gonna have to push hard. And then we got to organize, because 2022 is coming up. And some of these people, if they're not going to vote what they run on, because they ran on 15, they ran on doing this, then maybe the people need to primary them and run some other people. But we cannot allow poor and low wealth people to continue to get the shaft in this economy. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so rare to hear issues like the minimum wage described as racial justice issues, as you just did? Because too often we think about racism in narrow terms, like somebody using the N word, or we use or something like voter suppression. When in fact we should we should be talking about voter suppression in terms of economics as well as in terms of race, because vo voter suppression actually hurts poor people, poor white people. It hurts women, and we should talk about economic issues in terms of economics and racial issues. We should look at the disparate treatment. But you know, too often we don't want to do that. It's one of the reasons why the way we remember Dr. King, we forget that Dr. King connected race and economics, not just at the end of his life, but at the March on Washington. People forget the theme of that march was jobs and justice. They wanted a civil rights bill and they wanted a $2 minimum wage increase, which would be 15 today. So we have to rediscover how we deal with the issue of race. And racism always has an economic side to it. In fact, uh, one of our great scholars says that race is the child of racism. And racism as a system is not just against black people, but it's against black people, brown people, indigenous people, Asian people, and even progressive white people. Ultimately, racism is a hatred of democracy. And one of the greatest goals of racism is to keep divided. 
poor and low wealth people, what Dr. King called the Negro masses and the white masses, who if they come together, they can fundamentally challenge the ruling class mm. and reshape our economic uh, architecture in this country. I've always respected your work for talking this way, sir. So what do you want to see um, in the next bill that Joe Biden pushes through Congress in terms of the Build Back Better plan? In this infrastructure bill, you know, we actually put infrastructure before the president. We met with his his policy people. I had 32 people in the room, poor and low wealth and our economic advisors. And we said we need an infrastructure bill, but we need an infrastructure bill that's targeted to poor and low wealth communities that addresses the issue of racial uh, injustice and class injustice. And that's what we're doing now. We're examining this bill to make sure that it is truly reaching down to the bottom. We cannot have any bills passed that do not reach to the bottom. Before the pandemic, 140 million poor and low wealth people. After the pandemic, that number has increased. The people who were hurt the most in this pandemic are the people who were the poorest, the low wage workers who were forced to go to work, first to get infected, first to get sick, first to die. They cannot be the last to be lifted up. And so we're examining every piece of public policy from this perspective. How does it lift the poor and low wealth, the 140 million plus people in this country, because if it lifts them, then everybody else will be lifted. That's how we're going to be examining every piece of legislation. You floated the idea of primarying some of the Democrats who are standing way of progress on issues like a $15 minimum wage. Is that something that you or your organizations might get involved with? Well, the Poor People's Campaign would not directly as a nonprofit uh, per se, but there are a lot of discussions. I mean, listen, the Democratic Party's platform ran on 15, the platform that came out of the convention. They also said ending poverty was a key aspect of their platform. Now, you can't have a platform just for play or just for window dressing. Either you mean it or you don't. And so I think that what's happening is people are looking at this and saying, how can Democrats, of all people, now, Republicans have never seen an increase of wages they like. They've never seen a tax cut they hate. But how can Democrats of all people say no? And one lady did a thumb like this in a little dance mm-hmm. out of Arizona. How can you say no to $15? $15 is, is 5 or $6 lower than what the living wage ought to be. People can't make it on 725. There's not a county in this country where you can make 725 an hour and afford a basic two bedroom apartment. Come on, America, we can do better than this. We must do better than this. Billionaires have made over a trillion dollars in during the pandemic. We should be ashamed of this, but it also recognized that it is economically insane not to lift from the bottom and build this, uh, build this. Uh, I like to say, build this economy forward greater than we, mm-hmm. we than it was. And so, yes, I think there's a lot of conversation about people being challenged. You don't get a free pass anymore. If you vote against the people, then the people will challenge you. And I hope that some of the people challenging will be poor and low wealth people, people who are actually facing this. Time for some people, real people who experienced this to run for office and say, you will not hold this kind of power and then vote against my life. And let me say this lastly, I bet you not one of those senators has ever voted to cut their salaries. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I bet you're right sad. about that. And Reverend Barber, we know that you put those low wealth voices forward in a way that's really unique in American politics. We're grateful for that and grateful for your time today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I want more rising for you after this.